And I want to start with a, an experience to me that was a huge revelation. And it was July 1994. And it was a huge revelation to a, to a young man called Johan as well. I facilitated a so-called diversity class at Pick and Pay. And we had a, a few young trainee managers in the room, uh, a nice rainbow profile of people there. But in the one corner sat Johan. And Johan, this was July 1994, didn't want to be there. And he sat like this and peered over his glasses, uh, this diversity class, and breathed through his moustache and resisted to be there. At some stage, I asked them just to share a, a personal memory from their past, from their childhood. And Tepu then shared a memory of when he was a young boy on the farm. And he was naughty. And his dad wanted to give him a hiding. And his dad caught him by his left arm and Teppo said he had oversized khaki pants on, Teppo himself, from his older brother. And his dad was like the hub of the wheel with Teppo on the left hand and dad trying to hit him on his khaki pants with a stick and Teppo was trying to run away like this. And he said as dad struck the khaki pants, the dust came out of the khaki pants. And while he was telling the story, I had a look at Johan, not, not that one, Johan sitting in the corner, and he had tears in his eyes. And after, when Teppo was finished, I said, Johan, what's, what's happening? Does it sound familiar or what? He said, you know, exactly, but exactly the same happened to me. Naughty on the farm, oversized khaki pants from my dad, uh, from my older brother, dad with a stick, dad the middle of m m midpoint of the wheel, and I'm trying to run away from him, and he's hitting me on my khaki pants, and the dust come out of it. And he said with tears in his eyes, and he walked over to Tepo, and he said, he is also human like me. Now, now, that maybe sounds absurd and, and outrageous of a statement, but to a staunch racist, it is a huge breakthrough and, and an important step in, in recovery. Uh, because Johan, like myself, when I have moments of racism, uh, minutes, sometimes hours, suffered from three sub psychological abnormalities. <laughs> I, I see racism as a, as a psychological illness. At the moment that you have it, at that moment you are not well. And the three are, and that's just what I want to focus on this morning, that racism is perceptual laziness. It's a perceptual distortion. And it's a lack of sophisticated thinking at that moment due to distorted biases, and lastly, it's a numbing of feeling with or empathy. Johan had that numbing up to the point when Tepu told his story, and then Johan started feeling with. So those are my three points. It's perceptual laziness and distortion. A racist and myself, when I find myself moments of racism, I'm actually blind at that moment to the wonderful array of individual characteristics of the person in front of me, of the faces of the other. And this makes racism at its most basic level a perceptual distortion. A white man said to me the other day, that he will never be able to recognize the wanted African criminals on page two of the star 
because they all look the same. Now, of course, it's because he wasn't looking intently enough. He didn't have visual sharpness as he looked. He may be focused on just two elements of their faces, the color of the skin and the shape of the nose, maybe. Then a black businessman said to me the other day, from a company, he said, yeah, but all Chinese people look the same to me. And the same reason is he isn't looking. He's maybe seeing just the narrowness of the eyes and the black colored hair. And that's why they all look the same. And there's been fascinating research on how do we look at the faces of people from our own race and from other races. And they, they can scientifically measure it in the lab. Your eye movements over the face of somebody that you're looking at. And they found a distinct own race bias or own race effect that when you look at somebody's face from your own race, your eyes move more vigorously over the face. You have more what the Americans call sensory uptime. <laughs> Uh, you, you're scanning the whole face. When you look at uh, a race from uh, somebody from another race, then your eyes become lazier and you focus maybe on one or two points and the eyes remain there for longer. So you're not as sharp and vigorous and alive at a perceptual level when you look at somebody from another race. And that's why they always sometimes look, look uh, the same. That then can go into a lack of sophisticated thinking uh, due to distorted biases, which is the second point. So it's basic, it's more of a perceptual distortion. That then goes up into a thinking or a cognitive bias. The brain naturally categorizes things into sets or groupings uh, to make sense of confusing and unclear information. So uh, categorization creates order out of chaos. And there's nothing wrong with categorization. <laughs> it, it arranges information. It makes it more manageable to understand uh, and to put uh, things and people into understandable groupings. So from a moral point of view, uh, the brain does it naturally. There's nothing wrong with saying somebody is black or somebody is Indian or somebody is gay or transgender or has a physical or mental disability. That's not morally wrong. But it's what we make of the categories that matters. So when you use categorization uh, to stereotype, if you go from here and you start stereotyping and then prejudice right up to racism and dehumanization and lack of empathy, when you use your categorization in that way, then you've developed a cognitive imbalance, a, an intellectual, intellectual lapse or error of massive proportions. <laughs> At the bottom, of course, we get generalization. You give identical characteristics uh, to all members of the same group, irrespective of the wide variety of characteristics and qualities amongst the members. You're treating them all in the same way at the bottom. Generalization or stereotyping. And it's part of being perceptually blind. The minute we do that, at that moment, you are actually, and me, intellectually backward, cognitively strayed, <laughs> one can say. All women are softies. Uh, whites have no sense of rhythm, Kaiser. 
Stereotypes can also have positive associations, like all Jews are good in business or the Swiss are neat. But ultimately, it has negative effects because you are denying the person's individuality. There are whites that can dance, and there are black people that cannot dance, and so on. At the next level, prejudice. And that is when stereotypes carry negative or derogatory assumptions or beliefs. Then it starts blending into prejudice. And that's a hostile or negative attitude towards a distinguishable group of people. Oport already here in the 1950s said prejudice is a dislike based upon faulty and inflexible generalization. Faulty and inflexible generalization. And he said, the minute you have prejudice, you are following the law of least effect. You are lazy in your thinking. And prejudice, of course, can also influence back to your perception. So there's a wonderful study by Duncan, who let white American students watch a conversation between a black and a white man. And then the white man just gently shoves the black man at some point in the conversation. And then, in another set of circumstances, the black man gently shoves the white man. Exactly the same movement, exactly the same behavior. When white people observe the white person shoving, only 13% interpreted it as violent. 13. When white people observed the black person shoving the white, 73% of the participants interpreted the same behavior as violent. 73 versus 13. In another experiment, they showed a pain, showed white or black male faces. Just very briefly a flash, before flashing a photograph of an object uh, to, to, to the observers. And they, they, that was a handgun and a hand tool, but he flashed it so fast that you almost couldn't see it. The white participants were more likely to identify the tool mistakenly as a gun when it was preceded by a black face. Then they started seeing. So uh, the tool, the hand tool as a gun, significantly so. And it seemed to almost happen automatically. So your prejudice can also influence your perception. And your perception can influence your prejudice. Then at the next level, of course, discrimination. And we often mix up these terms. And they, they're distinctly different. Because discrimination has more a behavior component to it. It's, it's unjustified negative or harmful actions towards a member of a group, purely because of his membership of the group. For example, in my field, there was a wonderful study where they admitted patients to a psychiatric hospital. And independent observers assessed the degree of violence of the patients who were admitted. And significantly so, the white patients uh, sorry, the black patients were less violent than the white patients on admission by neutral observers. Yet, in the first 30 days of stay, were more likely to be treated by the all-male white staff with physical restraints and tranquilizers than the white group. So the white staff perceived the black people as being more violent, although they were not. They were actually less violent. That's discrimination. That's, that, it's coming through in action. 
in a behavioral component. And then, of course, racism, as you know, the ultimate higher level where you perceive one race as superior to another. That's per definition what racism is. And uh, it's, it's a specific form of prejudice and discrimination that has a power dynamic to it. And also a system of advantage based on race. But it's the superiority inferiority dynamic that, that is at play there. And then from, from a psychological point of view, the worst uh, is dehumanization. It's, uh, it's, it's the worst form of, of one-sidedness in thinking, where you're reducing the whole group or the person to subhuman status. You remember the the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda. You have to kill the Tutsis, said the Hutus, constantly over radio broadcasts, because they are cockroaches. And in this newspaper, it's, it's a hate speech newspaper, Kangura, constantly also, and in this edition, edition 40, a cockroach cannot bring forth a butterfly and you have to kill them, and constantly that propaganda. And in just 100 days in 1994, 800,000 people were slaughtered in Rwanda by ethnic Hutu extremists. Similarly, Goebbels and Hitler used this propaganda film where they compared the Jewish people to rats and you must actually see the clips on, on YouTube. For genocide to occur, it must be preceded by dehumanization of the group. And research shows that the minute you dehumanize people, then it facilitates aggression. And it, and it entrenches your superiority, of course, over that group. In the research, there are two forms of dehumanization. And Jan, this is actually an instrument that they use where you can slide on a scale <laughs> uh, by how much do you see people as uh, on the evolutionary scale, Americans, Arabs, and so forth. And here is the result of uh, an American study. Can you see the Muslims, the, the Mexican immigrants, the Arabs, much less human? <laughs> on the evolutionary scale. And there is more than a half a dozen studies that show that the minute you do that, the minute you, you do blatant dehumanization, like penny sparrow or monkeys, then it facilitates aggression towards the other group, it increases discrimination, it gives people a license to violence. I'm quoting studies now. And it, you also rationalize, you explain away intergroup violence. And of course, it embeds persistent and continual conflicts. And oh, Donald Trump is riding on this. Studies have also shown that the minute you dehumanize another group, then they are more likely to dehumanize you back. Uh, so that's interesting. Then you have your handout, and I'm closing up, a subtle form of dehumanization, and that's in, on the first page of your handout, where you have, there are two things uh, that make you, uh, or two aspects of humanity. The one is your human uniqueness that differentiates you from animals. The other one is your human nature that makes you uh, uniquely human. And the top list are the positive characteristics of human uniqueness and human nature. And then just at the bottom of that is the stereotyping that can happen at these more subtle kind of uh, racism that can happen 
where you see another group as childlike or irrational or immoral or coarse, that kind of thing, opposed to their, their human nature. So it's blatant uh, discrimination, uh, dehumanization, and more subtle dehumanization. Lastly, um, a feeling, a, num a numbing of feeling with, which is really on top of, of this whole progression of, of uh, racism and psychological distortion. Here's an interesting study. There are two sets of emotions. The primary emotions is what you share with other animals, the big ones like anger and surprise that you see with cats and with everything, Dis the, uh, disgust and courage. The secondary emotions are more subtly human, and that's things like remorse and embarrassment and humiliation and so forth. Your perception of your own in-group, and that's what the stats show you, is that your in-group has more secondary emotions, more the subtle, refined human emotions, and less of the primary emotions, those that we share with animals. But the out-group, the competitive group or the other race, has more primary emotions and less secondary emotions than you. So you're not feeling with, you're actually seeing that they have less feelings than you. Which comes back again, lastly, to the face. That if you don't have empathy with somebody else, it's because you're not looking at their face. And there's wonderful studies that have shown that people who have high emotional empathy, the minute they see somebody's face and that face shows a certain emotion, then their face mimics the emotion, which then creates a similar feeling that the other person is experiencing. So that's empathy, feeling with. But if you in the first place are not looking and your eyes are lazy on another race, you don't feel with. A white conservative person, a woman told me here in the early 90s, she said, seeing a black woman cry on TV, with the camera close up on her face, crying softly about her daughter that was killed, for her was a major breakthrough that they also feel. <laughs> they also feel deeply like us. Here's a fascinating study. White people they, you look at the hand, a video of a hand being injected in a very sensitive spot. White people looking at a white hand has an automatic, and it's automatic, it's what they call corticospinal system, it's an automatic reaction, that you have empathy with that. You also experience pain and they can measure it. A white person looking at a white hand experiences similar pain. A white person looking at black hand don't have that reaction. A black hand looking at a white hand don't have that reaction, but a black hand looking at a black hand has it. Automatic empathy of pain. For us, here's an interesting one. Similar experiment. A Christian looking at a Muslim hand. No empathy of pain. Christian looking at a Christian hand, yes. Similarly, a Hindu looking at the Jewish hand, no feeling of pain, no empathy. So, here is some of the, the brain measurements that you can actually, when somebody else experiences pain, those, part of your, those parts of your brain light up. When, you, when the person that you see as a stranger experiences pain, those parts don't light up because you see the person as a stranger. You have no empathy. And uh, that reminds me of old Jimmy Kruger when Steve Biko was tortured and killed. He said, it leaves me cold. And that is cold. 
your brain is grey. Nothing lights up. There is no empathy. So, in the light of all of that, and talking about Steve Biko, I share his hope that in time we shall be in a position to bestow on South Africa a more human face. And literally, from a perceptual level, right through. <coughs> Thank you. <That's coughs>When I sat down, I also had to think about how do we define racism? It's usually, it has to do with the ranking of people. And second, the labeling of those who has been ranked. Then the discriminating starts and eventually legislating against those of lower rank. And that's what we had uh, in, in, in our country. But let's look at a few pictures from the rest of the Western world. You might recognize this if you have ever seen um, benches in, 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 in uh, Germany. Nur für Arier. Recognize that as similar in South Africa whites only type of benches that you that you got so you can see why people the the people from europe why they had such a revulsion in 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 south africa and the policies that we are practicing because it reminded them of what happened in in germany but we were not alone there is something from america Sign at Greyhound Bus Station, Rome, Georgia, 1943. And this from South Africa. B beach and sea, whites only. <laughs> we had this for, for many years. Now, there are people who think that racism only is of recent origin. Um, while I was preparing this, um, I had a look on the uh, uh, website of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, the word Aryan, uh, how do they uh, understand that, or how do they define that? And they say, in Europe, the notion of white racial superiority emerged in the 1850s, propagated most seriously by the Comte de Gobineau, it's a Frenchman, and later by his disciple, Houston Stewart Chamberlain, a Brit, who first used the term Aryan to mean the white race. This belief that originated in Europe that there are certain groups that are a uh, higher uh, um, type of, of human beings than, than the rest. But... Uh, and this is what I would like to argue. Racism is not of recent origin, uh, say the middle of the 19th century. It comes a long way. And it also has to do with how Christianity, to my mind, developed and how that influenced uh, the, 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 the Western world. This is a wonderful book that I uh, discovered uh, while I was at Stellenbosch uh, at, at a conference, and this uh, lady, Nina Jablonski, um, was a research fellow for a, for a few months there, and uh, I heard that she published this book, and, and, and in that book she, um, she made this wonderful statement, and uh, it... I took it to heart. The association of color with character and the ranking of people according to color stands out or stand out as humanity's most momentous logical fallacy. The thinking that people of white color are more important than people of a darker color. 
And Kala, as she argued in a, um, in a book, and as you should know by now, skin color has to do with where we originated on this planet, where, we, where our forefathers lived. The fact that we have white, white skin color has to do that our forefathers lived in, in Europe, where the sun um, does not shine that much on, 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 on the earth. So we, we need uh, vitamin D to uh, be uh, healthy. People who live or lives more in the tropical areas, more to the uh, center of, of, not the center of the earth, uh, the equator, us usually have a darker skin color. Uh, and that has to do with biology. It, it has nothing to do with people being better or whatever. And then another statement that, that um, made me reflect about the situation in, in our own country and how um, people of a different color has been treated uh, throughout um, the centuries is the statement people of Africa of African descent have suffered slavery persecution and discrimination in Christian nations for centuries it was not other civilizations it's specific Christian and the whole idea of Christianity being this wonderful religion this religion that should be ranked top of all religions it is exactly in christian countries christian nations that this idea of superiority um, took root and were developed and this is another book that uh, this is a study that a roman catholic theologian made about how um, Catholic missionaries, how they experienced people from Africa when they came to Africa to, to Christianize uh, and, and how they reflected on, on, on the people that they, that they met. And he says there are not only one form of racism, there are actually two forms. Biological racism, the fact that we look at skin color and think, yes, people are, can be ranked differently, but also cultural racism. And that is what uh, Dion also referred to. The fact that we think, uh, and you often find that, that people say, well, look at the Western world. What has we as Westerners done throughout? Show me Africa, show me where Africa developed the wheel or whatever, whatever, whatever. Cultural ranking of, of people. As if the people from, from Europe are at the top um, of the ranking system. And then two books um, which informed me um, about my, my thinking about the whole idea of uh, Christianity being involved in the development of this idea of ranking of, of people. If we go back to the history of Christianity, where did it all start? Christianity developed out of Judaism. The first Christians were all Jews, but later on they took in a lot of uh, Hellenists, people from the Greek uh, civilization, Eventually, Christianity became a Hellenistic religion, one can say. The, they severed their ties with their Jewish brothers, and an enmity developed between Christians from, you can say, the Hellenist part, and, and, and um, the Jewish or, or people from uh, Judaism. 
you find uh, this idea of, of looking down at other people, of discriminating or even labeling people already in, in the New Testament. Uh, according to John 8 verse 44, Jesus should have said these words to some of the Jews in his days. Your father is the devil and you choose to carry out your father's desires. Uh, you also find this uh, something similar in the Revelation, the last book. I know how you are slandered by those who claim to be Jews, but are not. They are Satan's synagogue. So what do you see here? Is the demonization of the other. Labeling of the other. Demons. You are um, sons and daughters of the devil. And then this little book um, discusses the crisis of the relation between Jews and, and Christians throughout the centuries. And remember, this happened in what we today know as uh, Europe. You can say in the first two, three hundred years, there was a switch in the power relations. The Romans acknowledged Judaism as a legal religion. It, it has a long history behind it. But the Romans did not recognize Christianity as a legal religion right from the start. They saw it as an aberration of Judaism. Only Judaism was regarded as a, a legal religion recognizable religion. But as soon as Christianity or a, a Roman emperor um, uh, recognized Christianity, suddenly there came a change in power relations. He decreed toleration for Christianity. He made Sunday an official holiday. It's not that uh, Christians celebrating Sunday, they are not celebrating the Jewish uh, Sabbath. It is also not uh, something similar to the Jewish Sabbath. It's totally uh, different. And it cannot be motivated from the Bible. It's totally a different uh, kind of holiday. But it also, he also forbade Jews to accept converts from Christianity. Up to that time, there was uh, um, Christians often went to the synagogue as well, attended synagogue services. <coughs> there was a to and fro between Christians and, and, and people from uh, Judaism. Why? Because they recognized that, that well, Jesus was, was uh, a Jew. But uh, Constantine also convened uh, the Council of Nicaea, where Christianity was uh, clearly defined and a specific kind of Christianity was um, made the most important one. But another um, emperor with the name of Theodosius, he should actually be recognized as the one that made Christianity the official religion of the empire. It was not Constantine, but Theodosius. Um, and he forbade assemblies of Christian heretics. Only one specific type of Christianity should be recognized. And he went even further and he ordered the destruction of pagan temples uh, throughout the empire. And then Sapistein makes this following interesting remark. The unanticipated accession to the pinnacle of world power had considerable impact upon Christian thought. Now that the meek inherited the earth, doctrines of martyrdom and suffering servanthood were supplanted by an ide ideology of triumphalism. 
which identified victory and success upon the stage of history as irrefutable evidence of divine approval. Now that Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire, they also took on the form of the Romans and acted like the Romans and used force um, to convert other people. Now, during these years, we find into Alia the falling Christian theologian, John Chrysostom. Uh, you had a, or we had a lecture by one of my colleagues, um, Chris DeVette. Uh, last year, I think, where he told us about what Chrysostom thought about slavery. But listen to what he has to say about the Jews. Indeed, not only the synagogue, but the soul of the Jews are also the dwelling places of demons. So we can see how the Jewish people are more and more demonized. Uh, and became or become more and more demonized. And what happened then is a supersessionist theology developed. The belief that Christianity superseded Judaism and that Judaism should be ranked below Christianity um, and actually should not exist anymore. Christians are now the new Israel. They have taken over from the Jews. Interestingly, if we look at the material that was written during those years, <coughs> Jewish thinkers of antiquity never developed an articulated doctrine of Christianity, as Christian thinkers did of Judaism and the Jewish people. <coughs> if we come to the Middle Ages, we see how Jewish people were more and more victimized. And by the end of the 15th century, 15th century, Jews had been driven out of virtually all of Western Europe. From England, 1290, France, uh, thrice this happened in 1306. Then the Jews were called back and said, okay, you can come and settle again. Then they were driven out again, 1321, then again, uh, 1394. In Spain, 1492, in the German-speaking countries, Germany was not uh, a, um, a defined entity at that stage. It consisted of uh, many uh, countries. There were no less than nine expulsions between 1388 and 1590. So during the Middle Ages, Jewish people were extremely um, victimized by, by Christians. And in 1519, George, Bishop of Speyer in Germany, ordered a complete quarantine of Jews in his diocese proclaiming that they were, after all, not humans, but dogs. So you can see how more and more they developed uh, a labeling of Jews. The other, the other are dangerous. When we come to the age of the Reformation, the Jews developed hope that this might bring about change in the um, experience of what Christians are doing to them. Now, during the early phases of the Reformation, Jews were often blamed for the unrest in the Catholic Church. A case in point is John Huss, uh, one of the early so-called reformers. Fingers were pointed at him that he is um, uh, he and the Jews are hand in glove. And this saying developed, where there is theological trouble, 
look for the Jews. Now, Martin Luther was accused of Judaizing Christianity for his emphasis on the study of the Old Testament in the original languages. And interestingly, in his early years, Martin Luther published a tract with the title that Jesus was born a Jew. And he criticized the church uh, for the treatment of the Jews and called for, for more humane policies. But 20 years later, he published another tract on the Jews and their lies because he hoped that the Jewish people, seeing that they now came about a reformation, that the Jews will convert to Christianity. They did not. So he changed his mind and he wrote this book on the Jews and their lies. All synagogues should be burned to the ground, he said. Jewish homes should be destroyed. Their prayer books and Talmuds should be taken away. Their rabbi, rabbis should be forbidden, forbidden to teach. Jewish economic power should be broken. They should not be allowed to lend money. They should not be allowed to travel. They should return to manual labor. And this, if, you, if you read what he has written, it is almost astonishing that we can think that he was a good person. Uh, Martin Luther. Now, when you come to the church and the Holocaust, what happened in, in uh, Germany and Western Europe, uh, and we had a discussion just prior to, to this on our Facebook, people uh, stating that there never was a Holocaust. Now, Mark Saperstein argued the case that the policies of the Nazis cannot be linked directly to the belief that Judaism was superseded by Christianity. He is, however, convinced that the central Christian myth of Jewish guilt for the crucifixion played a role. And you know there's in uh, Matthew that verse that uh, the Jews uh, should have said, let his blood come on us and our uh, children. And it was reason that um, what the Jews are experiencing during the Second World War is actually God's punishment uh, for them. And the church, the Catholic church and other churches did not in mass criticize uh, what was happening uh, in, in Germany. At first they turned a blind eye. And they accepted this as, well, this is the, the punishment that, that they deserved. And in our group, we had a discussion of this book. Very, very good to, to read this book. Uh, and, and he, um, Harari, says the following about um, uh, Nazism. Afterwards, because precisely, or Sorry, afterwards, precisely because Nazi ideology was racist, racism became discredited in the West. But the change took time. White supremacy remained a mainstream ideology in America politics, at least until the 1960s. See, we were not alone. The white Australia policy which restricted immigration of non-white people to Australia, remained in force until 1973. And unfortunately in South Africa, we had to wait until 1994. So you can see that the total Western world were influenced, to my mind, by the idea of Christianity being important, uh, influenced by, by the way that they treated Jewish people. And this had also an influence on how people with a different skin color uh, should be treated. Now I would like to return, and this is my last remark. I quoted this, it was written in Dutch. Uh, I'll translate, but uh, the Dutch, there you can read it. Um, if I translate this to, to English, is it possible to eradicate cultural racism as long as the idea that religions can be ranked stays intact? 
Can the ladder of humanity be destroyed as long as the ladder of religions remain upright? Christianity at the top and all the other religions below. So that is why I say there's something inherently in Christianity that also influences people to think that people from a different color, from a different culture, ranks lower than you as a Christian. And that also plays a role in missionary work. Because um, when you go into the world, you never meet as Christian the other on an equal footing. You always, always meet him or her as a heathen, someone to be converted to your higher ranking religion. Thank you. My colleagues who have spoken spoke to you about the theory of racism. So I'm going to share with you approximately six decades of Anivarit being the recipient of racism. And you will see how well it ties in with the theory. And I had no idea what they were going to talk of until, like you, I received the presentations this morning. So I've broken my presentation to you in my life's journey. And the first portion is my origins. So I was born in 1957 in a place called Friedidor, Johannesburg, and in particular on the 21st of May in 21 Street, Friedidor. That was approximately nine years after the National Party came into power here in South Africa. Born into a family of nine children, my dad was a tailor until the day of his passing on, and my mum a housewife. In the family there's two sisters and seven brothers, and all seven, my dad promised, would not become tailors. <laughs> and all of us are professionals starting with the elder brother who became a school principal, etc., uh, etc. Et Shortly after my birth, I think probably five months later, the family relocated to Zierest, and then subsequently we moved on to Pochestrum. So growing up in Pochestrum in those days, I began and completed my schooling uh, at what they then called the Pochestrum Indian High School. We were fortunate, the family, in that we lived in the CBD of Poch, in particular a place or street called Potgitter Street. And in those days, I'm talking of the early 60s, I had white black and pink friends. There was no distinction. We were just children, naughty children growing up together. However, the majority of blacks, Asians and coloreds lived a few kilometers outside of town in a place called the Olokasi. And in that grouping were also people of Chinese origin, uh, uh, origins. So that's Poch University with whom I have fond memories. Uh, I will never forget on the one occasion that I was the acting premier of the Northwest Province. Poch University were having a Christian international conference. And they said to me, because I am not a Christian, they would rather that I don't come and open the Congress. And I simply overruled them and I said, sorry to you, but right now I'm the most prominent citizen in the province. And I insist I will be coming. And I did. 
So these issues are deep-seated, but Poch and I, the university in particular, at one stage I served on their council, and, and, and I do go out of my way to maintain my links with them. Then came the awakening. Around the age of approximately 10 years, I became aware of being treated differently. As you walked into town, you notice it was only white people sitting in the restaurants. For myself, when my mum sent me to go and buy bread or milk, we had to go to the store at the back and there was a small hole in the wall and you would there order your bread or milk and pay for it out of a small hole. So at that stage, the awakening said, but what is this form of existence where you had no equality, no human dignity, no freedom of speech, no freedom of movement, no security of person, no right to privacy, no right to belief or opinion, no right of expression, no right of peaceful assembly, no any form of political rights. We went to separate schools. We lived separate lives. We were in separate existences. And more or less around then, painfully, my white friends started disassoci disassociating themselves from me. When I would see them in the street and try to greet, it was as if I was a ghost that did not exist. And it was painful. There were, and we did not compare our notes, like I said, so I had no idea this bench was going to become so famous this morning. <laughs> the National Party engineered many, many laws that were hurtful. But the one that was most painful to me was the Group Areas Act. And around about 1968, was when the horror of the Group Areas Act came home to me, when uh, in terms of the Group Areas Act we were now being separated, and each one to his crown. And by the act of signing of the pen, all my childhood memories were erased. As Indians were moved to a place called Moadin, Colors to a place called Promosa, and African people were moved to Ikachen. And now, even the colored and African friends I had made were moved away. I am born into the Hindu faith. And therefore, living in an Indian community with the majority of Muslims suffered further discrimination. Because to the Muslim community, we were referred to as non-believers or heathens. And I'll never forget the first girlfriend that I went out with. <laughs> She happened to be Muslim. And her parents, when they found out that we were holding hands, became so incensed that they confronted my parents. And the hiding that Dion was describing was the fruits of my labor for having violated a code that I knew not that existed. 
So this profound status led me to start rebelling. And I started rebelling against an order of things, not of my ba making, but of my birth. I found warmth and acceptance amongst African and com uh, colored young people. And bearing testimony to our own common misery, I really wanted to change the indignity of our suffering. And so was born in me the activist. My innate sense of morality and a genuine abhorrence of violence I could not take up arms and therefore join the exile community. And maybe there's part of the DNA that comes from Gandhi that goes through us in terms of its nonviolent character. <coughs> so, in seeking to gain some element of status in a society that was so complex to me, I needed to ask what was the path to the power that I sought in order to make a difference. Having experienced the indignity of having gone out with a girl that I was not supposed to on account of religion, I was round about in Standard 7 and I made an effort of reading every religious book possible. <coughs> From the Bible uh, to every other book that could try and explain to me why is it that you have a loving God that sees us all as equals? How is it that I became unequal? And my conclusion after about a year or two of reading was this altstrand, all of them, and that for me, the only belief system is do good, and be good. Strive for truth, honesty, and beauty. And Kezo over there is my colleague. We consult together. He is an ordained priest. His job is to get me to believe. My job is to persuade him to see my worldview. Neither of us are winning. <laughs> so in 1974, when I finished matric, I was ready to go to university. I had to go to the University of Durban, Westville, 500 kilometers away from home. Poch University was 10 kilos away. The law then did not permit you without the Minister of Education giving you consent to study at a white university. And it was made clear you will not get that consent. So go to your kraal out there in Durban. In the absence of money after the first year, unable to go back. So I studied part-time through UNISA. And during this period of studying through UNISA, I worked as a waiter in a restaurant. I sold motor car space. And there was a time that my dad became ill, so I ran his tailor shop. So if any of you need to have a zip replaced or your waist taken in, I can guarantee you I'll be able to do that. <laughs> Currently, I have three degrees, but I only spent one full year at university. And that's this desire, not only about race, but about the complexities of the human existence that started forcing me to ask deeper questions about why are we here on this planet, What's our purpose? Where are we going? How big is the cosmos out there? What's our tie up to the galaxies, if any? And these big questions started troubling. So I continue to study on an ongoing basis, albeit not towards a degree. Around about 1985, a colleague of mine and I opened our legal practice in Clarkstop, which is 40 kilometers away from Poch, and we did it deliberately because Clarkson had been a bigger sending area with all the mines that are based there. In those days, 
as people of color, you could not have a business in the CBD which was reserved for white business people. The Law Society had to give us a special letter asking for the authorities in that town to exempt us from the Group Areas Act so that we could open a practice of law. 1985. So, I wanted to destroy the system because everything pointed to this system holding me prisoner. And the only way I could free myself was the destruction of the system. So we specialized in the defending of every person that was fighting the system. So whether a person was involved in a political trial, we were involved. Public interest law, like seeking extension of land, occupation of land, we were involved. And then labor law. Already then, uh, with the Vian and Rickett Commission, South Africa was moving towards progressive labor laws. And while they recognized laws of the ILO, at home, your apartheid laws were still intact. So in terms of the ILO, you may not discriminate at work between workers. So at checkers and pick and pay, the toilets had to remove the signs of whites and blacks. And Kaiser was a union organizer in those days. So collectively, they pushed for those rights, and legally we argued why they have to happen. And, and that was an interesting time of challenging the system. I personally participated in every possible NGO, whether it was a church committee, whether it was an educational committee, or any other NGO. We participated with the intention of pushing the envelope and challenging the system. And Annette Kombrink, who is uh, retired from Poch University, who, you know, in Poch, it's a DA, ANC mayor, depending which day of the week it is. <laughs> and, and Annette was one of the mayors during that time. Annette and I started the Western Transvaal Education Foundation in 1986. And I'm proud to say that that institution still continues and pays for the education of irrespective of color, many people that study at Poch University up until today. So in that time, because Clarksdorp, and you had your old four provinces, Clarksdorp was central to the Free State. We also had routes into the Northern Cape, and of course, Popodatswana, that failed uh, Bantustan experiment, was on our doorstep. So the law that we practiced covered this entire area. In that time period, I was detained. I was verbally and in writing abused and harassed. And there is poverty in power. In uh, 1994, I became, as a member of the ANC, the first MEC for police. It was strange that up until April 1994, I was fighting them, and then in May, I became their boss. <laughs> it was an extremely awkward situation when we met for the first time. Years previous enemies, sitting in one room, expected to make the new South Africa work. And from that day onwards, I worked tirelessly for reconciliation and nation building. Because Madiba cautioned us that if any of you young Turks have any desire to derail the democratic process of nation building, go find another home. It's not going to happen on my watch. So you go there and you reconcile. You find the common commonness in humanity. You seek consensus and take as many people along with you. And that's what we did. I used to go and spend through the police times with right-wingers on their farms 
with bry flies. And for folk in Fatherland, lots of uh, the nectar that is green and red in order to reach consensus and trying to persuade them that the violent route is not the route that we should go. I'd spent an equal amount of hours with youth from the disadvantaged communities trying to explain that developments are not going to happen overnight and that there are phases in which this development will come and that we should be patient in order for us uh, not to expect results overnight. And then in, I am not a politician, I am an activist. So my agreement with the organization was I will serve one term and then I will vacate my seat, which I did in 1999. Went back to good old Poikistrum, opened up my law practice, having a nice life. And the organization needed a executive mayor because it was the first time that you are having proper democratic elections in Poch. So I was deployed to become the first uh, executive mayor of Poch. I want to go towards my conclusion and talk about Africa, my home. Many people said that after racist practices, and the abuse, the gun in the one hand and the Bible in the other, <coughs> Africa will never see a white leader again in politics. And not so long ago, the deputy prime minister in Zambia was white. So I suspect that our evolution, there is no saying like you will not have in 20 years or 30 years, a colored or a Indian or a white president. And I sincerely believe in that because we're moving that way. So I've been out of this country approximately 80 times. And each time I come back, it's as if my soul has come back with me home because it's foreign out there. I love briefless. I love my khaki clothes. And I love all our national sports. I really despise corruption, dishonesty, and unethical behavior. I cry and complain for this, my beloved country. I continue with like-minded South Africans to build bridges across color lines, <coughs> class lines, and religious lines. Whatever boundaries that exist that prevent us from engaging like we are now, I seek to enter and lower those boundaries until they don't exist. And with some colleagues, we found what we call the Fellows of Fire. And it's just a group of like-minded people that come around the fire. And we talk about what we do, how we do it ethically, can we do it collectively, and to what extent can we exist independent of the political influences of the country and say this is my South Africa what am I going to do and forget all the negative reports we started in March last year it's a group of us in Johannesburg and Cape Town we've had now four sessions last year the fifth session next weekend is happening in Porch not because I come from there it was the only place Porch Den that could allow us the budget that we have so from 20 people that started last March, our invitation list is on 190. And it's South Africans across all shapes, colors, and hues. And it's more or less like this room where we say, come and give us your critical intellectual contribution of how we can make this place a better place. Because there is no other.
my grandchildren are going to be inheriting this country. And I don't want them to accuse, but where were you when your country needed you? So I can read the newspapers, I can watch television, but if I don't get up, my hands and my feet, do something about moving this country forward, I should not expect someone else to be doing it for me. I've got to put my hands into the mud and get it dirty. So I love this country because I'm a South African and proudly so. And with those words, I want to thank you for the opportunity of having allowed me to share the platform with you. Thank you. Ik wil graag net een paar aanmerkingen maken over, over elke spreker, iets wat ik opgeteld heb. Um, uh, voor Dion wil ik zeggen, uh, uh, ik, ik stem je altijd maar samen voor die genetische aspecten wat je genoemd hebt, uh, wat te doen heeft met die emoties om uh, mensen te klassificeren volgens je denken of je voorgevoel en dan waarschijnlijk ook deel van je achtergrond en je opvoeding. Maar iets interessants wat ik uh, een keer opgelezen heb, is dat asielkundige ene Paul Ekman, en ik denk je woord dit van met, um, nogal bij een navorsing gedoen oor die emoties wat wijst op ons gezichten. En hij drie emoties uh, geïdentificeerd wat mens kan waarnemen. Dat is alle ander maar zes. Kan mens duidelijk waarnemen wat de evolutionaire oorsprong heeft om gevaar in vreemdes te identificeren en met wie je dan kan associëren of niet. In die, drie emoties, of die zes emoties uh, is drie vrees en drie wees, maar je kan het makkelijk onthouden. Dus verbazen, vreugde, vrees en dan weersen, walgen, woede. Die zes emoties is baie sterk, maar je kan het lees op mensen gezichten om te kijken met wie je kan associëren en ook om te waarschuwen uh, uh, als dat gevaar dreigt. Dus so, dat is mijn eerste ding. Mijn tweede ding in Versaki, wat te doen het met, met die christendom. Uh, wat zo so discrimineren wil ik daarom net sê, dat is baie, baie gevallen in die geschiedenis van die wereld, waar discriminatie plaats heeft, wat niet meer die Christen noemt te doen Ik heb het in Amerika gewerkt en het is baie bekend daar, so dat onder die Amerikaanse Indianen is die Apaches baie schrikwekkend. Niet meer vandaag niet, maar volgens oorsprong. Het staan hulle net bekend, omdat hulle oor en weer ook aanvallen geloods het op ander stammen, wat niks met christendom te doen het nie. Die stagmoedige Indianen is die paloes. En ons kry hulle vandag nog in die, in die pere wat hulle teel met die kolle, wat die apaloesa is. Dit kom van hulle, hulle is baie onderdruk. En dit, dit is iets wat, wat, wat nie met de godsdienstige uh, uh, strekking te doen het nie. Selfs in Zuid-Amerika die Azteken en die Maya's mekaar aangeval en geplunder lang voor die Portugese en die Spanjaarde daar was. En uh, selfs in, in ander dele van die wereld, uh, in China bijvoorbeeld en in Vietnam is daar groepen wat mekaar aanval, wat niks met godsdienst te doen nie. En dan uh, bij uh, uh, meneer uh, Satish Rupa wil ik net sê, ek gesien u het een foto geplaatst van die Marikana skieterij. In Amerika gebeur er nog steeds een skieterij waar blankes mekaar skiet, in Californië. So dit is deel van die siege van die mens. Dit, dit, dit is nie noodwendig, nie noodwendig, rasse ding nie, dit is klasse. Ek het in Amerika op die plaas gewerk, die grootste paraplaas in die, werk, in die wereld. En ek kon nooit my post uh, gaan kry by die voordeur van die baas nie. Ek moest ook naar die achterdeur te gaan, omdat my klas daar was. Ik kon ook niet met die blanke dienstmeisjes daar praten. Ons dit wordt niet niet toegelaten. Zo, nie. so dit is een klasseverschil, maar wat in Zuid-Afrika gebeurt is, die klas heeft daar rassenconnotatie gekregen. En ons moet daarbij voorbij komen in leer. En de enigste manier, denk ik, is die opvoeding en opvoeden. Dat is mijn. Dat is natuurlijk je primaire emoties dan. En dan die secundaire is die meer subtiele, wat allemaal van daar af komt. Maar wat je meer de gedifferentieerd mens maakt. En wat interessant is, met die, met die walging emotie, het le, dan wijs je van mensen een foto van een homeless person. Dan 
gaan die deel van die brein wat walging het daai gevoel uh, um, lig op ne? of word geactiveer die oomlik wat hulle sê um, wat sy type kos sal hierdie persoon van hou dan is daar nie meer walging nie as jy kyk na die gezicht van een ander ras en jy word gevra om hom te klassificeer die oomlik wat jy dit doen dan word die vrees deel van die brein, van die amygdala en soan geactiveer. Die oomlik wat jy sê, hoeveel kinders dink jy het hy? Of weer eens, wat sy type groente dink jy sal hy van hou? Dan word daar die vrees nie geactiveer nie. So die oomlik wat jy meer gedifferentieerd kyk na mense sy behoeftes, dan verminder jou, jou walging en jou weersing in die ander. Kan ek net op die um, my focus op die, op die christendom ek het nou specifiek verwijs na die westerse rassisme en vir my uh, het die christendom in een groot mate daarmee te doen dit is maar wat ek probeer sê het, ek het nie een uh, uh, vergelijkbare studie oor islam of enige ander kulturele groep gemaakt nie maar omdat ek in die christelike traditie groot geword het is dit vir my belangrijk om eindelijk ook te vraag, maar waar kom hierdie idee van hiërarchie, godsdienst gewijs en ook mens gewijs, waar kom dit vandaan? En vir my is dit, dit woord gevoed dier ons, een groot mate, ons, 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 ons godsdienst in die weste. Ek, ek meen as ek die jodendom, die, die islam en die christendom uitverkore volk, daar begin die hele ding, jy, tensy ons hulle soos jy terecht beweer het, uh, kan oortuig dat dit alles net is wat jy gesê het, dit is, uh, het ons een probleem. Ja, uh, dis, dis, dis juist waarom ek dan ook denk, mens oor die godsdienste sal moet praat, en dan om terug te wees na Hans King, hy het gesê, men daar sal nie vrede kom, voordat ons as godsdienste en as godsdienstleiers uh, met mekaar begin praat, en uiteindelijk ook gaan vra na die grondsla van ons godsdienstige idees. En ek weet die ding van uitverkoorenheid, ek het, jy, jy, jy sou uh, rondom wat in Israel tans gebeur, ek weet, dit is, um, godsdienst speel daar inderdaad een rol. Um, en, en die feit dat die westerse wereld een blinde oog gooi, oor wat aan die Palestijne gedoen word, is onverskoonbaar. Maar dit het ook weer te doen met die weste wat een skuldige gewete het, oor wat in die Tweede Wereldoorlog gebeur het. So daar is ingewikkelde, maar ons moet het dier praat. Ek wil op een lichte noot een grapje maak, oor hierdie klop wat vir klei oor geloof. So het potje, toe ek nou burgemeester was, het ek een hele klomp rade gestig op my advies te geel. So het is een raad om armoede te beklui, en een hele klomp. Maar een van hulle was een raad van kerkleierskap. En omdat daar nou moslims en christiene en wie ook al daar was, het ek hulle gevra, allemaal uitgenooi, stig jylle eie raad van tyd tot tyd, wanneer ek of iets verkeerd doen, uh, ten oor jou gebed of hoe jy die lewe sien, kom terug na my toe. Ek het nie rade gehad, van al die rade, die een wat die minste recht gekryd en minste werk gedoen het, was hy raad. <laughs> <laughs> Hulle doen in mekaar bekleid. I read a old uh, psychology book about why people associate with each other. And then I realized how old I am already. <laughs> but they said people in general, most humans, if we talk on a human level, have an identity crisis. They don't they have difficulty to, th- to understand who they are and what they should be and do and so on. And that's one of the reasons they associate with a group, so that they can uh, fight that ambivalence, that uncertainty. Um, so I would say this whole thing of people forming groups comes from two sides. The one is the individual needs to identify with a group. And what we discussed this morning is the opposite side, and that is when you see another group, 
you judge the group as though they are similar, but actually the members identify with that group, which is the basis why we think they are similar. So I think uh, some of you guys mentioned uh, you had a big uh, wake-up call somewhere in your life. What shocked me a while ago is when I heard on the news a black person saying, I don't want to be a black. Do you know what it feels to be a black? And, and I, don't, I just felt so sorry for that guy. How must it feel if you are, by other people, associated with a group, but you are not proud of being a member of that group? Um, so I think South Africans have a big problem, if you are a, a child. Eh? Now you have this identity crisis that I started with. And you have to identify with some group, but there are so many different groups. Um, initially, when I was young, I also identified with the Afrikaner, which I don't do it anymore. I, I just consider myself an individual. But I think most people cannot do that. So maybe I could pose my question, what, what uh, advice would, could we give that black guy? He says, I hated to be a black. Uh, identity develops from group first, as you say. Family, community, country, <laughs> planetary, and it, and it depends very much. And the minute you form that group identity, then other groups become outgroups. And that's when you start seeing people as being different. Uh, the minute they're an outgroup or a competitive group and so forth. And that's when these perceptions start going skew and wrong. That you lose your common humanity for the sake of your group identity. If we now had an alien invasion on this planet, we would very quickly discover our common humanity because that's our broadest identity on the planet. Uh, if, if, if we had an invasion against, against our country from a foreign force, we might find common unity. And that is what Madiba mm. uh, tried to do and, and achieve to a certain extent, was that we have a common humanity that we share. Uh, don't focus so much on your group identity as the common humanity. And that's in response to Jan as well. The minute you think of somebody's humanity, the Dalai Lama also always to, to evoke compassion. Uh, the Dalai Lama says, people have the same needs as you. They just want the best for themselves and their family. But just that simple statement. Every person just wants the best for him or herself and his or her family. And the old adage of they, has hope, they have hopes and fears like you. The minute you realize that, you get away from clinging to your own identity. So if I elaborate on what you're saying, would that be, that, that black guy who said that, if, if being a human, generally, mm. was well defined, sufficiently well defined, mm. you could say, that's the label I put on my... Yes. Yeah. But is that the case? Um, Ahein, die zwart man op wie jy verwijs, was het een Zuid-Afrikaner? No, I think it was one of the students who okay, tried but, to but university. Yes, but you see, there's also an experience behind <coughs> his <coughs> life. <coughs> yes, to have been a black person in this country um, was not uh, a wonderful experience that you have. And that has been transferred from one generation to the, to the other. That's why younger people say, might say, it is not. Because they, they still feel that discrimination. Uh, listen to what, what is being said by students on our campuses. They still feel they are not acceptable, part of the South African nation. And it has to do with our history. That's why I think that person said it's not easy to be black. My, my, my take on this, Johan, is that we don't have sufficient opportunity to engage across different crowds. 
that way you're acted. So, again, on a lighter note, we're in a joking form. We were an official delegation in China. All four race groups as part of the official delegation. And the Chinese put forward a MOU before we started the meeting. I don't know what the MOU is. Memorable of understanding. We were trying to have cooperation by bringing a dragon city to Poch in, in the 90s. And all of us, communists, capitalists, conservatives, all from South Africa in the delegation, in one voice went over into Afrikaans. Yere mensa wat doen ons nu? So there's nothing like a common crisis that gets you together. <laughs> exactly. uh, I was born outside this country, uh, and uh, when I came here as a child, I was given a certificate with uh, my photo on it. It says uh, I'm now registered uh, as a, under the Aliens Act. <laughs> and, and I've still got the certificate, so if you want to see an alien being invaded, I, uh, I'm not here to invade you. We always knew you from another planet. I, I volunteer. I volunteer and become an enemy to vote. Yes, you can be a common enemy. <laughs> but the point I want to get to, look, we, I can see there's a, on the one hand, we want to uh, get people together who are similar, and on the other hand, we recognize that there's also a need to move out and to, uh, to get to know people with, with other ideas. Uh, so I'm glad that we have people from other races here. That's uh, maybe a move in the right direction. Mm -hmm. What I would like to see is uh, that we create uh, greater opportunities for us to share our ideas with people with, uh, with, uh, of other races and other ideas. Mm. Uh, about <coughs> the discomfort of being a black person, mm. there are hosts of studies that show that if you've been the victim of racism, you actually show exactly the same symptoms as a victim of rape. And you have the whole list of post-traumatic stress syndrome mm -hmm. symptoms that you get on the DSM classification. And one of them is self-loathing self mm -hmm. and yeah. shame and so on. So uh, people that have been victims are very, very sensitive and they've hurt. Literally, it was a, a, a hurt that is not just emotional, it's also physical. The same, precisely the same areas in the brain light up when you, when you feel separated and isolated from others than when you have physical pain. So it's, it's a pain of the heart and one of the symptoms is self-loathing. A friend of mine's daughter, after watching TV, remarked and said to the mother, Sorry for apartheid. Sorry for apartheid. To the mother, after she observed whatever TV program depicting the past. I'm not sorry for about it. I was shaped by the experiences. I am who I am because of that journey. And I every day praise God for exposing me to experiences, different experiences, even this experience. I don't have any baggage, but I have experience, mm -hmm. but not baggage. Mm -hmm. I have nothing that really every day I used from apartheid to define who I am and where I'm going. It was, it is as if I would never lived under apartheid. I, I wish there was a scan to scan me to see if at all what I'm telling 
is true. Because I have no regrets. I have no grudges. I have no issues with anybody. Okay. I really don't. I feel sorry for people who deny themselves enjoying the juice of the moment as they journey in life, mm. depriving themselves from interacting with others, understanding the other, and connecting to a higher purpose of being just good people and learning the way to be human. Thank you. Thank you, Fraser. Well seen. <laughs> Fritz, last. Yeah, I actually wanted to say something, but I think in the light of what, what uh, Kaiser just says, I just want to condone that. We wrote a book, Picking Up Diamonds in the Dust. I want to say there are diamonds in the dust of diversity. In Europe, where I'm now, uh, they find that companies who leverage the opportunities that comes with diversity are outperforming the market sometimes eight times. And I think, as, as, as Kaiser says, let's stop being guilty, let's stop being angry, and let's leverage this fantastic gift that we as South Africans have. And I'm still a son of the soil, although I'm living in, in the UK. We've got a gift to the world to give. And I think let's appreciate, as, as you said, Kaiser, you know, this made us who we are. And let's move, you know, and pick up the diamonds in the dust of diversity and, and not look at the darkness of diversity. Thank you very much.